Holy Spirit of counsel all those who are serving in positions of authority and responsibility. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Mr. Brooke, please. Ms. Alice, yeah. Mrs. Nato here, Mr. Sowell, Mr. Zelensky, Present. Mr. Boucher. Present. Okay. Um, I'd like to take this item, uh, item number five, if I may next, presentation of other post employment benefits, OPEP funding program, Rhode Island and Philippine Trust Risk Management. A discussion by Council Board of the Action Authorization for Signature. We have uh, an individual here to explain this, uh, explain this to us. And, Due to the inclement weather, she lives down in South County. Uh, I'd like to give her an opportunity to get home safely. Very much appreciated. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Motion to move it up. Second. Okay. Motion by the chair, second by the council. So, any further discussion? Hearing none. Now, clerk, roll call, please. Ms. Alice. Yes. Mrs. Nato. Yes. Mr. Sully. Yes. Yes. Yes.
It's not an entity like this trust that's set up separate that operates as its own entity. Right now, we just have a savings account with money in it. So just so you know, we're not here yet, but this is where we want to go. And we'll circle back on why that's important and what the differential is in that when we get to the funding component of it. But basically, this our organization has set up this OPEB funding trust, as I mentioned, as a result of member requests. We've also worked closely with the state, the, go the governor's office, with um, the treasurer's office to make sure that they are okay with us setting this up. Back in 2012, we had legislation changed for us so that we were able to actually offer this type of program to our members. And our goal is basically that all of the work has been done for you, that if you were to set up your own OPEM trust on your own, you would have to go out and get your GASB compliance um, IRS 115 <coughs> ruling. You'd have to get uh, all the legal work done. You'd have to have all the paperwork done. You'd have to have um, uh, 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 tax exempt, IRS tax exempt status reviewed, et cetera. So what we've done is through this program, by if you uh, choose to adopt the resolution that has been presented to you either tonight or in future uh, dates, we would then take on all that responsibility and basically it's a turnkey operation that all of the work has been done for you and I believe all the documents have been forwarded on to you for review as well, um, the legal documents that would need to be signed, etc. But basically the most important thing is that we will make sure that you are always, your OPEB trust would always be in compliance with um, state and federal laws uh, that relate to um, irrevocable trusts. Members ask, so if I put in all of this money and it's irrevocable, and I can, can I ever get it out? You can get it out to obviously pay for retiree health cares at any time that you so choose to. You obviously have to show proof that you're paying for those, um, or life, retiree life or dental, any of those benefits. Secondly, um, if you have funded your OPEB liability and there is no more liability for the town, we obviously do not need to keep that money anymore and it is returned to the town um, once your OPEB liability has been satisfied, which is a good thing. <laughs> um, so what we'll do is, um, Although you're looking at, by, when you join here, the benefit of joining the Rhode Island Into Local Risk Management Trust OPEB funding program is the economies of scale. Because you, you would be joining with other municipalities and school districts in Rhode Island, you would have the benefit of lower costs associated with the fees. So there is no um, money to join. However, there are monthly fees that are paid to PARs. There are monthly fees that would be paid to um, Vanguard and to U.S. Bank for you know doing the work on your behalf to make sure your investments are safe and um, everything is in compliance. So the trust, our trust, never would see any of the money. We are just really the program sponsor. We kind of do all the work, but we're the puppeteer that's pulling all the, making sure all the legal papers are delivered to you. Where you're. Uh, liaison between um, Vanguard and uh, PARS, etc. But the money is once you decide to join and make a contribution goes directly to U.S. Bank, and that is set up as a sweep account. And then they then, based on your funding and options for investment, would then forward it on to Vanguard and make sure it's appropriately allocated. Any questions so far? <coughs> yes. Hi, Colin. Thank you for coming out this bad weather. And then I'm looking at this, I'm certainly not a financial player, but when I look at PAWS Direct Trustee Service Fee Schedule, you said there were 16 members in currently. Yes. Do you have an asset? How much an asset is there to be 16 members for? Um, we currently have, um, right now, over 25, just over 25 million in contributions. I'm not sure what the investment, um, actual investment strategy is right now. I don't have that for today. But I also have three members that have yet to make any contributions because they're still in those early stages. So we anticipate that it is going to grow. And as we talk about the fee schedules, um, the beauty of this is that as more and more members join, both here in Rhode Island and others that PARs are working with that are set up under this Vanguard account, um, there are those economies of scale that the fees will go lower. Sure. I'm looking at the. Uh 5% for the first 25 million, which according yes. to you, we're currently, the 16 members are at the 5%, we'll drop to 4 with the next 25 million, 
-hmm. So what it's important to know, and if you you're on page, I'm looking at you're looking at the fee schedule. Is that what you're yes. looking at, page 11? Well, no, I'm not there. I, actually, no, I'm looking at institutional trust uh, custody. It's the third page that I have. No, it's not. It is not paginated on mine. It just says uh, institutional oh. trust custody part direct trustee service fee schedule. Oh, I, I, you're looking at the actual legal document that would be signed. Yeah, okay. Good for you. <laughs> okay. Um, so what I've done is I've taken those documents and consolidated into slide number 11 for the rest of you if you're interested. So we're looking at the fees because it's broken down into PARS, U.S. Bank, and Vanguard. So yes, you are correct. What's important to note is that it's based on the individual portfolio. So the growth portfolio has to be at $25 million. The, um, um, so if you, whatever portfolio you or other members participate in. So um, it is not based on the total assets of the trust. It's the total assets, but in each individual funding program. So there are three investment strategies. There is a growth, a balanced, and a an, an conservative account. So it have to be reaching thresholds at each one of those individual investment strategies. However, it's important to note that if you were to go to a bank on your own to try to um, fund your OHEB uh, program individually, you would not be able to <coughs> receive these types of rates. I believe you have to have at least a $50 million contribution to even begin to see uh, these uh, very competitive rates. Okay, Colin, you could further explain to me. So basically what I'm looking at, and if I'm understanding, and I don't understand, I'm going to defer to our finance director mm -hmm. to fill in my blanks. So the annual phase, 0.5 for the first 25, 0.4 for the 25. Then I look at investments, uh, Vanguard, this is on page 12, I guess, of your, your slides, your points you were talking about. Right, I gave you a hypotheticals. Cost. Okay, so would, so would it be, uh, 5% on the first 25 under PARS direct trustee and then an additional 7% on the Vanguard's investments? Yes, that each one has a separate fee associated okay. with it, yes. And that's why I showed on page 12 and then also on page 13, so there's some other benchmarks there to show some fee schedules because obviously that's important for people to know, so we thought we'd, this slide seemed to be helpful to say that what is, if I had a $500,000 investment, how much is my monthly fee going to cost uh, to have this OPEB trust function? Okay, now I'm going to, uh, Mr. Igliozzi, if I may, help, if you could help me with the legalese on this part. If I heard correctly, this money would not be able to be removed from the from the fund unless it was to uh, administer it to people's benefits, correct? Retirees, right. Retirees, right. Mm -hmm. But when I look at additional information on page 12, uh, it says fees may be changed by Vanguard Institutional upon 90 days written notice to client. Is there an escape clause in there for the town? If the say the, so, the yes, fees go up, can we can we escape from this? Yes, deal? you have to give a 30-day notice. So if you said in 30, if you decided that you didn't want to be part of this program, the only problem, not problem, the only requirement is if you chose not to participate any longer in this OPEB funding program, you'd have to give us 30 days notice. But you have to then move your money to another irrevocable trust. It can't just go back to the general fund or to, okay. you know, just a private bank account. It has to go to another irrevocable trust. Uh, and I, I just want to, Jason, have you had a chance to review all this? Is this uh, reflective of what's out there for us, uh, the competition? It's, it's um, the, the, the fees, yes. The difference here with why I'm presenting or wanted the trust to come in with this presentation is the economy of scales and the legal rep representation that they're going to give to us mm -hmm. to make sure all the benchmarks are met with IRS regulations, with trust regulations. If we were to do this in-house, we do not have an expertise to create and administer this plan. Um, right, and, and one of the other things is we periodically will bring in Vanguard and TARS to come in to actually make presentations to the members to give market outlooks performance, and I know Jason has been in attendance for those, and it's been very helpful for our members because they are then able to access these individuals, and they are also available by phone. Um, and, you know, depending upon if we needed them to come out again, we're actually scheduling them to come out in June again to come give us another 
outlook of uh, what the, each individual pools look like and what their market strategies are going forward, market outlook. Um, I think it's also important to note that um, we did have um, one member that is a current member now that actually did all of this on their own uh, probably five or six years ago that they set up their own OPEB trust and when this um, opportunity came along they did some side-by-side -side analysis to see if there was savings for them and what their ultimate um, analysis was is that they saved the town about $20,000 a year by moving their OPEB program to um, the trust OPEB funding program, so they closed out their OPEB trust. We transferred all the money over, and so the town is paying lower fees by doing that. One more question, President. Mr. Have you looked at this? Before? I looked at it briefly, but I was actually anticipating the presentation. Um, I, I looked at the agreement briefly, but yeah. the, um, obviously this is, as uh, Jason pointed out, it's got to do with retirement benefits. Rather than pay from your, the key is: Do you want them to be in your general? The fundamental question is: Do you want them to be part of your general fund, or do you want them to be in this trust that constitutes both an asset and an obligation, liability and an asset for the town? Which once you put the money in, you can't take it out. Mm -hmm. Or do you want to pay it as you go, <clears throat> which is what you're doing now? And I think that's what really I want people to see is what the dollar benefit is to go from a pay-as-you-go that we are now to the trust. Ultimately, the trust is a self-sustaining entity. The earnings on the investments pay for the retirees. So the hope is, at some point in the future, the 688000 for retiree health care we currently have in our operating budget goes away. I think a good um, example of that is um, slide number nine um, in your presentation packet. And what we've tried to do is, um, just as Jason was um, alluding to, is what is the impact of pre-funding? So right now, um, as I'm sure Jason has told you, in your financial statements, there's basically a footnote of what your OPEB liability is. However, moving forward in um, coming years, I believe it's, uh, if it's not 2016, it's 2017, I believe. We're adopting for 16 for this. 16. Yeah. So that you would have to actually, um, with GASB 75 changes happening, that they are actually, your OPEB liabilities is actually going to be shown as a liability on your um, financial statements. So there's another benefit for you to you know, move it out of just a bank account into uh, an OPEB trust because if you look at page number nine, the benefit that you receive, and what we've done is this is actually based on the town of North Smithfield's actuarial results um, as of 2014, and which is the most recent because they're only required to be done every two years. Um, so what we've done is, right now, the unfunded actuarial accrued liability is about um, 7.1 million, which is the pay-as-you-go, which is what you're doing now. Should you pre-fund your OPEB trust, you will see that there's a discount rate of about 7%, so your uh, unfunded actuarial accrued liability then reduces down to $5.5 .5 million. So just by taking these small steps, to pre-fund, you can show that you're reducing your ultimate liabilities. And basically, you'll see on the bottom line is that the annual required contribution, if you were to make that based on these actuarials, and I will tell you that most cities and towns are not making the, act, the annual required contribution, uh, so you're not alone, it would, you would have to make a $788,000 just to meet your required contribution. If you pre-funded, um, that required contribution would reduce to 680000 So there are some benefits. You can look to see um, the percentage changes that is reflective by just doing these small amounts each year in funding for your OPEB liabilities. This is where it gets real, the technical stuff, but from, from a financial standpoint, by pre-funding and reducing your ultimate liabilities, you're helping your bond ratings, your um, other types of liabilities that you have in the towns when the auditors are looking at your financial statements. So you become a healthier um, entity. So for me to just give a little brief explanation of what Colleen just covered is, if you remember this year, we had a large addition to our balance sheet of the retirement funding to the state. Yes. Historically, it was never on our balance sheet. This year, it became as a requirement to put on your balance sheet. It's about $20 million for us we had to add. This is another seven per accounting rules that has to come on next year. 
If we have an asset that has an earning power, that 7 becomes 5.5. So when you're adding 7 million to your liabilities in your balance sheet, if we have a pre-funded asset that has an earnings power, the liability goes down by about 1.6 million. So it's value there as well as ultimately to try to get out of the operational funding of retirement benefits. There, there are some members that have asked about if you can, you know, similarly to how you do pay as you go now, you can, some of them said, well, what if we put all of the money in and then, um, you know, withdrew at the end of the, at the end of the quarter or at the end of the year, um, what is the benefit? Well, the benefit is if your investments go up, then you're going to be you know, making a little bit of money. But this is truly meant to be a long-term solution where you're going to see the savings as a long-term solution. It's not meant to be the quick fix, although it can be used to help um, fund that. And I will tell you, there, there is no requirement that once you join that you have to make an, uh, a contribution. There's no minimum that you have to submit. If, you know, if the town puts it into their budget to submit it over, then uh, that's a great thing. I think it's a great first step. But we don't have a, 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 a contribution amount that is required. This is a very easy program that sets up that once the resolution is passed, literally within two weeks, your OPEB trust would be set up. And um, Jason would be as the fund uh, or plan administrator for the town, so he would be the one that would have to sign documents as well as the council president would have to sign a document because that resolution gives the binding um, authorization for Jason to be the plan administrator or the finance director, essentially. And then basically from there, once the documents are set, we give you the, we get everything all um, put together and we say that the banks are ready to be funded and uh, the accounts are open and whenever you are ready, you can start to make contributions. It's as easy as that. We, we've done them in it's less than one week because uh, they had to get it done by June 30 last year. Um, and then it, we've had some that have taken longer just be, because of time commitments and, and scheduling. Jason, do you know, do you know the, uh, what the initial contribution would be? Um, as Kali mentioned, there's no required contribution. But um, uh, to circle back to what I said initially, we have set aside about 150000 over the last three years to start to fund this post-employment benefit trust. So budget for 16, 100000 was put in there for 14 and 15, 25,000 each year was put in there. So we have 150 on hand that could start this contribution. Future contributions are related to what we put into the operating budget. So for the 16 budget, a tax rate already supports 100,000 contribution annually. So if we kept it 100, no change to the tax rate for next year. So it's already built into the rate based on our reserving money for this purpose last year's budget, if that makes any sense, or what we've accumulated over the three years. All right, thank you. So that would be, I believe, what our initial contribution would be, this 150 based on budget approval, and then whatever we decide to budget for next year would be what the contribution would be, whether it's the same amount, whether it's less, whether this year you fund it zero. I mean, I believe that would be on the budget process to decide. Thank you. I have a question, Mr. President. Good It's maybe because I don't understand this. <clears throat> Is there a protection here for the town of North Smithfield? If we pre funded, we make payments in OPEP and other communities which have a live representation down on Smith Hill don't. Where does that put us? Is this money going to be, can that be touched by future legislation to help offset communities that don't fund OPEP? No, this is, um, this is your OPEP money. Although you are reaping the benefits of the economies of scale of being with other municipalities and school districts, yep. it is your own account. So you don't share liability with anybody else. Uh, the state has no investment or, uh, or no involvement whatsoever. We just needed a legislative change in order for us to start the operations of an OPEP funding program. And it has been, if you will, blessed by uh, the state, the treasurer, um, the governor's office, et cetera, which was important because they were the ones that were pushing it. And if individual cities and towns did not start OPEP trust, they were going to enforce that it be done. And we wanted to keep it at the local level. And so that's why we did that. So, um, no, this is um, your money. You will receive a statement on a monthly basis that would show um, your account and uh, the fees that are associated with that, etc. 
You would also on a quarterly basis receive investment um, updates on the pool that you selected for investment purposes and how that fund is doing and, and performing. And by you, I mean that they would go to the fund. Like the so kind of we have dedicated funds to whomever's in, in, in the... So, uh, <coughs> right, so you basically, one of the things that you have to do if you decide to move forward with this is you'd have to then pick, if you decide to move forward, that's step one. And then step two is you have to select what's your investment strategy. What would you want to go a conservative approach, a balanced approach, or a growth approach? I will tell you that, and it's the trust will not um, make any recommendations because that's not where our expertise is. And I think that Jason certainly will work with you on that. But um, we will provide you with what other whatever information you need from financially from each of the pools and how they are performing. But I will tell you that the majority of members have actually picked growth. Um, as their investment option, which was a little bit of a surprise to us. Um, they are spread out. We have some that are in balance and a couple that are in conservative, but they are looking at it as a long-term funding option, so they're looking at growth. And they're all mutual funds within these individual um, investment options, so they're all individual uh, mutual funds. I was just concerned that five, six years down the road, we've managed our OPEP on the communities have not. I know no one's clairvoyant, but you know, I just would not want to see North Smithfield for some of the uh, state legislation. Well, you're doing a good job of sharing the pain of the other communities. So, like, am I articulating that, that, David, what my concerns are? I think you are. I, I, think, I think that's a very good point. I, mean, I think the fundamental question is, a trust has to be created for the benefit, these benefits. Is this the right vehicle? And it appears that, that um, the interlocal the trust, trust. The inter -local <laughs> trust is going through the trouble of, of making this connection. Yes. This doesn't have to be your choice. You could go to a, a, a bank on your own and create your own OPEP trust. So right. that's your choice. You could go somewhere else completely. Right. This is just exactly. an option. Yeah, I understand. Okay. I guess what my concern is, if we don't know what could happen five, ten years down the road so, with other communities that have not are we going to be asked to help supplement them, even though we're, we've been taking care of our OPEP? That's well, and, and your actuary is only going to report on your actuarial status at this point. So there, there is not going to be a big trust um, actuary that's going to come in and look at everybody, if that's maybe what you're thinking, too, that the trust actuary would come in and look at the pool as a whole and say, well, you've got to help out you know, South Kingstown. And, and that's not the case. Um, you have your own actuary that's going to report on what your own on, you know, annual required contribution is and what you're required to do. Okay, so yeah, if not, okay. I'm just concerned what might happen with the uh, legislation. That's all. Thanks. Thanks. Jason, Jason, what's the, what's our time frame for uh, for acting on this? For acting on this? Yes. I mean, it's kind of unlimited if you want to look at it that way, because we've set aside money and have not taken a step in a on action on this for three years. So, you know, if, if we look at it that way, we haven't acted yet. And I, I guess we don't have to act. I think um, the point of why I wanted to have this on the agenda for you to hear this is the sooner we act, the better scenario we have for the long-term picture of our community. That's really why I got this on, on the um, agenda before and why it's back in front of you. Is, um, the longer we kick the can, the worse off it is for us. And I think that if it's done before June 30, which is your end of your fiscal year, you'll see those benefits right away in your financial statements through your audit. Does Council have any more questions? Um, with the three different portfolios, um, which one would you lean towards? Growth or uh, 
growth balance looks like serving what for um, That actually would be a discussion that I'd want to have with everybody because that's the direction that the town chooses. I wouldn't say I have a better choice than what you'd have as a choice. Just play the stock market. Right? It, basically, that's what it is. And um, as a as a me as a man, I'm conservative, so I would go with either the balanced or the conservative approach myself. But that being said, if there's an opportunity for us to grow, to make this asset huge in the short term by going into, you know, taking out a little more risk for a growth portfolio, maybe that's what we do initially. Well, I was going to say, if you I just take on the initial risk to get the reward, you build up your portfolio, and Correct. eventually it's 0% down the road. Correct. I mean, we're talking years down the road. Correct. So still and, good. And, I, and I will tell you that you're able to change your investment option at any time. Uh, we actually have one member that has changed it three times already. They've been in every investment option because right. they thought they wanted to be in growth initially, and then they went to balance, right. and then they said, no, we want to be in conservative. And, you know, it, it, there's a document, another document that has to be sent, signed, but within a day we can make that investment option change. So you're not locked in to the investment. You know, if, if if you see that the stock market is not doing what you like and you'd like is to there, change your strategy, is there time restrictions on how you can change your investments? So I know, like my personal account, mm -hmm. I can. It's like a thirty day. If I move today, I gotta wait thirty days no. before I can change again. No, I told you we had one that went three times within. Oh, like a couple within, weeks. Oh, okay, yeah. all right. I don't want to do that much, but. <laughs> No, they're very good to work with um, as far as um, with PARS, and, and you'll get notification that that has been changed and <coughs> confirmation that you're in that investment strategy change. Thank you. I, I would also assume that as I'm getting the statements and watching performance, everybody's going to be in the loop on the direction the town should be going in. So it's not a unilateral decision here at all. Right. It's a community decision, and I'm, I'm, I'm kind of the vehicle to make that happen if we want to look at it. Sorry, you said we get quarterly reports. Is that well? Do you get monthly statements, which would show your assets um, and your fees, and then but and you will get quarterly investment reports from Vanguard that get delivered through the trust um, that would be delivered to Jason. But on a monthly basis, you'll be able to say. What I will tell you is, it's not like your bank account, unfortunately, because everything is thrown into one big fund. So PARS actually has to do some slicing and dicing to make sure everybody's getting allocated appropriately. So we are a little bit of about a lag time of a month. So if you were to invest in April, you probably wouldn't get your first statement until June. And we're working on that, because that's one of my requests to them to speed up the process. But at any time, if you wanted to know your a balance, we could get that for you. So you don't have to wait for the, the account balance statement to come in. We would be able to get that for you anytime through an email, etc. request. Now, do you have like uh, online access to the account? No. No. No, no we don't. Not yet. Okay. Someday, maybe. Because it's just, it's in a whole big pool. It's not just the town as on its own. Any more questions? Mr. Rector. Wake Rapco about the budget committee. You could ask the budget committee to help you. I haven't seen the document. It sounds like an annuity. I mean, you've got three choices and you've got to put this money in long term. You've got expenses. But the, the issue I guess you've got to be very careful about is, is the benchmarking. When you put your money into a, a process, I mean, you're expecting a return on that money over the long term. So there should be a benchmark. I know this is new and it's hard to create a benchmark. But if you go into a conservative, balanced, a growth fund, there's an expectation of your return. And I guess a lot of times, you, sometimes you don't meet that expectation. Now you have issues that take, it may take 10, 20 years to recover what you're expecting. So it's a process I think it's going to take a lot of research to try to understand what's going on. Uh, you know, treat it like an annuity, that you're putting your money into a process where you're going to pay a fee, and you have an expectation depending on how you invest that money. 
and then you're going to try to look for a benchmark, what, what you're comfortable with. And it's a difficult decision as to, you know, what are you comfortable with this money? You don't want to lose it in the market if the market goes sour, because it takes 10 to 20 years to recover. What happened in 2001 took 10 years to recover that loss in 2001. So it's, it's a process that, you know, it's something that I'd be cautious tonight. I think it's going to require a lot of review in the process. I was trying to understand the fee structure. I'm not sure what the return is. I mean, you have to pay these monthly fees. What's the net return on a monthly basis after you have to pay all these expenditures? Are you going to end up with a quarter of a percent or half a percent in the process? I don't know. That's a discussion you need to you know, continue. The other issue, too, is at Smithfield, we're benefiting from the fact that we, we capped our liability on the teacher side, on the school department side. It's a seven-year liability for health. The teachers can collect uh, retirement for seven years or age 65. So we were very fortunate we did cap the liability on the school department side. We haven't done that on the municipal side for police or municipal employees. But that's a way of reducing your liability is to try to do what we did on the school department side by capping the liability with a, with a time limit of seven years or age 65. It's a difficult process. We, you know, if we could spread that throughout the whole community, that would really cut down on the liability. When you talk about assets and liability, to reduce your liability from seven million to 5.5, .5, does that happen immediately? Or does that take a long period of time to reduce that liability? I'm not sure if there's a, 10-year window, you're, you know, we're only putting a small amount of money into the program. It's hard to visualize how do you reduce a liability of a million and a half if you're only putting 150,000 into the program. I don't, it's, you know, my, my uh, comment would be maybe you should ask the budget committee, Brian O'Hearn and maybe some other members, Beth Pharisee and myself, whether we can help you to analyze the process. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rapko. Mr. President. Yes, Mr. Rapko, currently it's budget time. So do you think the budget committee would have that time to review this? Well, we should. I mean, we should put it on the agenda and take a look at it. I don't know what the extent we'd have to ask Jason. What, are we, what is our cash flow for the OPEB cost on, on an annual basis? Is it 25000 50000 for our expense on it? For OPEP expense today. For OPEP expense, it's pay as you go. It's $688,000 that we pay in retiree health care and, and um, health and dental. For all, all, for all that goes through the town. The school side, the school. I don't have in front of me. So, so they're on their own. So the town is just $688,000 alone. $688,000. Yeah. Well, that's, oh, it's that's $688,000 pay plus, as you go yeah. plus the hundred yeah. of that. Oh, right. That's right. Okay. So that's how you get the seven eighty eight. dollars Yeah. yeah. So, do we need a motion to ask the budget committee to uh, take a, to review this for us for their opinion? Uh, that, that's my motion. I'm going to second that. Motion Thank by, you, Mr. Rafko. Motion by Councilman Swinski, second by Councilman Nato. I'm going to take a discussion. Hearing a matter, clerk, roll call vote, please. Mr. Hoss, yes. Mrs. Nato. Yes. Mr. Sol, yes. Mr. Zolinski, yes. Mr. Boucher. Yes. Yeah, that's what I was just saying. You can take my copy. Take my copy. I don't hear anything much. Just part. Just overlook my notes. Mind you, give to Miss Pharisee. Thank you, Mike. Okay. Um, we turn back to us at the uh, item the number three executive session. Chairman Allen General Laws 42-46-5A, subsection 2, sessions pertaining to collective bargaining and litigation. Potential litigation with socket distribution into a jurisdictional wastewater agreement. So moved. Motion by the Chair, second by Councilor Nato. Move into executive session. Madam Clerk, roll call vote, please. Yes. 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 Yes.